Did anyone hear mature freedom in their celebrations? Yes? No, okay. Um, but I hope your 4th of July was good. Hope you had a fun time, um, that you celebrated freedom, I guess. That's a, a good thing. Um, it was actually a little bit strange for me to celebrate 4th of July this year. There maybe should be a number of reasons why, but I'll just share one, which is I was in America. Um, if you know anything about my past two summers, I've been in Uganda for both of those summers. Uh, so I actually was in America this time. So it was interesting to see, like, okay, I, I see the fireworks again, like the celebration. Like, it was uh, interesting to get used to being here uh, after being in Uganda for two years in a row. Um, that trip that I've been on to Uganda has been an amazing time. Um, it's been one that's been a five week experience with Ugandans and Americans um, doing ministry together. And last time, the last year, was the first time I led that trip outright. And that was a little bit of a confusing and hard thing. The Americans, in particular, asked me questions. A lot of questions. Uh, questions about, where are we going? What are we doing? What should we wear? When's the next thing? No, seriously, when is it? Like, when do we actually really have to be there? Not the time that you're gonna say, but the time where everything starts. Um, and what's happening right after that thing? They were asking questions all the time. I was basically the human schedule. Uh, that's what I was to these students. And I was the human schedule in Uganda, a place if you know anything about it or the country surrounding it, there's a different kind of cultural value on time. Maybe you wouldn't say it's known for being a punctual community, a punctual culture. Uh, in fact, I saw that many things were different uh, for these Americans that were struggling to learn about uh, Uganda, um, how to belong there, what to do there. Um, they were trying to interrogate the rules of the society, asking questions like where, how, why, and of course, most critically for our journey, when, the all-important question of when. As I try to navigate this as a leader, and trying to be a mature leader, um, I'd have to repeat myself, you know, the times and locations, probably about 10 or 15 times each session. Yep, two o'clock over there, you know, no, right over there, the hut, the one that we were in at breakfast, yeah, 2 p.m. Yeah, 2, 2 p.m., the hut, like just over and over again, sharing the different times. Um, and as we, uh, as the time neared for whatever event was happening, I'd find, again, I'd have to just uh, keep sharing. And I'd have to be there early, right? There wasn't a quick text I can send that said, you know, I'm on my way, no one could communicate to me. Like, you either were there or you weren't. And we had no idea where people were. It was a kind of, sometimes we're in big spaces. It was like, I have no idea where people are. Uh, and if I wasn't there on time, there'd be this thing that would happen where would be like, oh, well, Josh isn't here. So like, then the thing that we were scheduled, right, just isn't happening. It, I know it's 201, but it's just not happening, right? And they would just walk away. And then I have to like find people and find some other people. I'd be like, Tina, please, can you help? I just need that. So it, it was a bit of a struggle for me. So to, to beat that, I would, I would hustle, I would jog, sometimes I would, out, I would outright run to get to the place in the right time, just really hustling. Uh, and this was to follow a rule. And it was a rule that the Ugandan culture didn't really seem to respect or care about that much. Um, and even my American students and friends, they were very interested in knowing the time but I actually found out they weren't that interested in showing up on that time at all. Um, so that was a bit uh, strange uh, for me. Uh, and it was uh, destabilizing, I think, as these students tried to learn things and know things, but I think it's maybe just because they were struggling with uh, a cross-cultural experience. So then I would be there, sweating profusely from the Ugandan sun, waiting one minute, two minutes, five minutes, and finally, the first person would come. Oh, that's, a, that's nice of them to come five minutes late. But then, maybe five minutes later, it'd be another trickle. And then probably about 15 or 20 minutes later, we would get everyone, seriously. Uh, and this happened for each thing. Uh, and so, even though the Americans were the ones obsessed about time, when I actually looked at the crowd, oftentimes it was the Americans who were dead last. So the Ugandans had a little bit more of a cultural respect, but Americans were just kind of at the end. Um, so as a leader who was pressing into this kind of as a goal of like timelines, it's not my natural way of being in the world. I was like, I was trying really hard. I was getting, I was getting a bit frustrated. Uh, it, it was a bit uh, annoying. And you can ask Tina. Sometimes this would like ruin sessions for me. And I'm not sure if it was ever like the session was on the love of God. And I'm like, ah, this is so annoying. Everyone was 20 minutes late to like the session on the love of God. It wasn't that explicit, but I was just like, man, like I probably shouldn't be as angry as I am right now, like as frustrated as I am right now. Um, all because people were late. And at some point, Tina just kind of, you know, this is what Tina does, she's, she's great at it. She kind of just gently, Josh, like, should you be so upset that people are late? I was like, but they're late, like, that's a problem. It's like, I, I know, but it seems to be like, kind of affecting you in a certain way. Do you, do you really want it to have that, like, effect on you? I was like, oh, I guess you're, I guess this kind of makes some sense. And, and I, I think she pointed out, and I realized, I was upset 
about a rule that I didn't really care about at the end of the day, that other people didn't care about, but that upsetness at a rule had become sort of this internal judgment that I had. So now I had to kind of check myself. I'm having this internal judgment, this reaction uh, that's pretty, pretty bad and kind of ruining my experience, uh, not helping other people's experience. And it was all about um, this kind of thing that I was holding on to that I just had to really let go of. I really couldn't be that concerned if people were a minute late, five minutes late, God forbid, even 15 minutes late. I just had to kind of go with the flow and trust that uh, people weren't disrespecting me, it wasn't an issue of disrespect, uh, trust that people weren't trying to make this happen, they're just struggling to be on time in a place that was different, especially for the Americans, and to trust that God would actually make up the time. If we actually had to do something in a certain amount of time, just had to trust that God would work it out in big and small ways. Um, these interactions I had with Tina and with the team and with God uh, were actually pretty helpful in maturing me through the trip and helping me out in my leadership. Now, where my adherence to rule following kind of blew itself up at the end of the day, leading me to judge other people or even myself thinking, man, I'm not really leaving the trip well at all, um, I saw that God actually cared for me and God cared for others. There's a way that he kind of intervened, just gave me a little tap probably don't want to be focusing on this. There's a lot bigger things at stake. Uh, just care about the real experience people are having, um, not just uh, the letter of people being on time. Uh, this focus on laws and rules, even small ones, can be really important when we think about our lives and our own experience of them. Uh, this path of trust, um, actually trusting God and trusting others over and against laws, whether they're religious, whether they're cultural, whether they're even the laws of the land. That's actually what Paul really is getting at in this text that we've been studying for a few weeks now, the letter to the Galatians. It's really uh, the biggest thrust of the letter. Um, what do you do with these kind of rules that we have? Again, religious rules, rules of society, and even rules of uh, the law of the land. And these are some of the earliest letters that uh, he wrote. Uh, so we're really getting a sense of Paul's kind of imagination about this what Paul's thinking at, uh, early on in his career. As we've been discussing this past few weeks, the transformation of Paul that led to him writing this letter is nothing short of astounding. The fact that Paul is writing this letter is kind of crazy. Um, he's the product of a religious system that led him to persecute people who deviated from any sort of uh, core tenets that he considered right, uh, either practice or right belief. And Paul's adherence to the law was so overbearing that even though part of his law said do not kill, he killed to reinforce that very law. This is how out of control Paul got. So how did he change? Well, what, what happened? Paul had an encounter with Jesus. Not a new set of rules, not a new system that was convincing to him. Jesus appeared to him. He intervened in his life. He actually spoke to him. He made a difference in that way. There is a, a different sort of zeal that Paul had when he had an encounter with a person as opposed to a set of rules. And that becomes something of a mission statement for Paul. He changes the zeal that he had for rules and makes it a zeal about a person. Um, and in the midst of this conflict that we started with, talking about this text, a conflict about what does it take to be a follower of Jesus, with some people saying you had to follow certain rules these rules of Jewish culture, dietary rules, the rules of circumcision. Paul had an objection that I think would have been very different from his earlier life. He said, I don't think it really takes all of these things. I think it's about a person and our relationship with him. There wasn't a prerequisite anymore of Jewish practices, but instead there was a prerequisite of a relationship, um, just simply getting to know someone, getting to know Jesus. Uh, you can guess that Paul was solidly on that side given his experience in life, given the encounter that he had. He actually thinks that Jesus has a gospel, and that gospel is good news for all people. And the gospel, as we've seen it in Galatians, is something like this. Jesus gave himself through his life of selflessness and eventual death, sacrificing himself on the cross for our sins in order to set us free from the present evil age. This is the good news as told in Galatians by Paul. Just this kind of short phrase. Paul seems to think that we need an intervention. That's what he needed. So I wonder if here today, we, we wonder what, what could an intervention with Jesus do? 
Are our best systems, our best kind of structures, ways of interacting with the world, are they working for us? Are they leaving us disconnected from God, maybe from ourselves, from others? I think sometimes our ways of making ourselves right, even though they have a benefit to us, can leave us exhausted, exhausted and tired. But there's a, a different way that Paul talks about. It's a way of faith, the way of faith. And that's what we'll be talking about today. As Paul deepens his argument, he kind of goes further in giving uh, the Galatian community a reason to think about why faith could actually change everything. He actually uses this ancient person for his argument. Uh, it's a person of Abraham, the story of uh, a father of faith known to by many religions. He uses this path of Abraham to contrast the path of the law. Abraham to the Galatian audience would have been incredibly revered as a religious man, as a man of faith, um, and that's, someone's, that's really important in the multi-generational story of God and God's people. Why would Paul include someone like this in the argument, right? It's, Abraham hasn't been mentioned at all. We haven't kind of gone back uh, to mention someone at that time period. Why would Paul mention Abraham? I think that's one of the questions we have for us today as we look at this text. And before we do that, I want to pray for us. Uh, God, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for uh, the gift of faith, and for the way that you actually give that to us. God, I pray that here, wherever we are, you'd help us receive uh, what you have for us, whether we feel disconnected or connected to you or to a system, um, whether we feel that there are just some rules that uh, we want to break out of, um, either rules we feel like we're following or ones that we yeah, need to end. God, I pray you'd give us wisdom and you'd help uh, wherever we are that place be alive and real uh, today so we can apply this story uh, what Paul's talking about to our own lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. So this is a scripture that we're going to start with. Just as Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham, who believed. It's just a quick story about Abraham. Uh, but I think we need to know more of the context of his life. And, and what does it mean that he was actually found righteous? That righteousness was reckoned unto him by God? Um, you don't know much about the story of Abraham. He came from a background where people really didn't know much about God, and you really couldn't say that many people were following that God, were actually walking with that God. Um, now it would even be true of Abraham himself, until God spoke to him, until God kind of shouted out into his existence, and Abraham sort of woke up from that and saying, who, who are you, God? Um, first, God called Abraham to go into this new land um, with little reason as to why and honestly, with minimal relationship, Abraham didn't really know much about this God. But the call came with a provision that's found in this promise. And this is from the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings in Scripture. Now the Lord said to Abram, another word for Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. You might think that there should be like some more paragraphs here, like who's God, like how is he kind of approaching Abraham, is there more backstory? No, this is all we get. So just imagine like kind of having some experience where you just hear, go, go from your home, go from your country, just leave, and there's gonna be a promise for you. Just believe me, I'll, I'll show it to you. Like that, that's really what happened to Abraham. Um, that's was the, that was the introduction he had to God, and to not only God, but kind of what he was about, his story. God seemed to be about him leaving, right? And how, where, who? Nope, just leave. I'll show you more along the way. That was the first direction. Nothing more and nothing less. And the response to this call, what does it require? It requires some kind of faith, some kind of trust to actually kind of follow this out. Why, why would you do it? And I think to do it, you need to trust a little bit, to trust in God, to trust in this story. Um, but as you might anticipate, this wasn't the only moment of faith for Abraham and for this journey, not just uh, a journey to go. But uh, Abraham was asked to exercise again his newfound faith 
by trusting that generations would come from him um, on this journey. The generations actually would come. But what was the problem there? Um, he actually couldn't get uh, pregnant with his wife. So again, he's forced into this position where he has to trust to keep the story going, to keep the blessing going. He has to trust. And this time, uh, he trusts God. They conceive a child, and you see what happens. Abraham trusted God. Something happened. But as soon as this long-awaited child arrives, what's the first thing that happens in our story? Um, God instructs Abraham to sacrifice this child. It's a bizarre turn of events. It's a definite challenge, I think we'd say, to God's trustworthiness. I think we can agree on that. Like, this is kind of strange. Why would this happen? Um, but Abraham, for some reason, obeys again. And God prevents the actual sacrifice from happening. He with, kind of withdraws himself. And Abraham, again, shows he trusted God. That's part of the story of Abraham, part of his character, part of why he's called holy and righteous. Indeed, this trust to the call of go, I think, fundamentally marks Abraham's life. I think it defines his life more than anything else. When God shows up, when he directs, Abraham responds with trust. And I think it's that trust, that faith in God, that's reckoned as righteousness, right relationship, right standing with God. The trust is rich and dynamic. I think that kind of trust that Abraham has is unique to him and his relationship with God. But it's relevant for us still today. I think we'd have to admit that this kind of trust pales in comparison to systems and rules, to laws. Um, Paul continues this argument uh, in his story, in his narrative, in the letter, turning from this path of faith that Abraham represents to a path of law, and he shows the consequence of it in pretty strong language. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Paul isn't, you know, mincing his words here. You, you're all under a curse. For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. So there's a way to live by law, and there's a way to live by faith. We see faith personified by Abraham, by the story of going, being blessed, even though that requires a deep trust in God. We see the way of law being defined as actually a path that's cursed. How can the law be cursed? The religious law, the laws of society, even the laws of culture, how can that just be fundamentally under a curse? Well, I think there's two ways of looking at it. And one's a very plain reading of Paul's argument. If there are rules and we have to follow them, what usually happens? We break the rules. We, we actually can't uphold them. Um, this kind of logic is intense, it's, total, it's totalizing it, it often devastates us, right? Like, we just can't follow all the rules. But part of what we do in life is then we just we kind of make the rules less important. So I think Paul here, he has an argument, but I'm not sure who in this room, our goal is like, I want to follow all the law, like all of it, like religious law, that religious law, like societal law, this cultural law. My, my guess is we all kind of don't want to follow this kind of totalizing law. But um, I do think we create our own kind of rules our own kind of standards, our own kind of culture. It's kind of personified more just kind of in what we think is the right way to go about life. I think that one's a little bit closer to home. Uh, that becomes a law, and I think that can become a mix of religious law, um, cultural law, civic law. But no matter what the combination, no matter how we define it, these standards and systems actually outlast us as we can't meet their benchmarks consistently. We just really can't kind of notch uh, those into our belt all the time. We end up making mistakes. We end up losing them somehow. So I think that's the first way of seeing the law is something that fails us. But also there's something much deeper, I think, and interesting in Paul bringing up the law. What if the law is just a structure that fundamentally has conditions? Like each law has a condition to it. And that's one of the ways that law works. If you do that, you get this good thing. If you don't do that, you can avoid that bad thing. To get what you want, you have to follow a rule. To get what you desire, you have to be part of a system. It's just maybe one of the ways it works. But that's very different, that system, than what's happening with Abraham, what's happening with this promise. A promise seems to be very different than a law. For the promise for Abraham, it simply existed as what was to come. 
even when Abraham maybe doubted it, even when Abraham didn't see it as possible, the promise just existed on the horizon. It's something that was going to come. And the promise isn't conditional. The law is, but the promise itself isn't a conditional promise. And I think this makes more sense when you actually look at Abraham's story a little bit more closely. We see that kind of picture of him with holy and righteous. Well, there, there's a few things that happens in his life that should maybe make those titles, uh, maybe just have a little asterisk by them. Um, Abraham lies a lot. Abraham cheats a lot. And there's two famous um, examples of Abraham basically giving up his wife to a foreign ruler uh, for safety and protection. I guess that's his safety, not his wife's safety, because he doesn't seem to really care about it that much in those times. This is Abraham, the same guy, like the holy guy, the righteous guy. Like, this is Abraham. This is who he is. Um, he breaks the law actually before there's even a law to break, because Abraham predates the law. Like, so he's br breaking things he doesn't even know um, are going to be written in the Torah, um, in the commands of God. He doesn't really meet the standard of a good husband. He has character blemishes on his reputation as a religious leader. Um, and even if we're gonna care about this, he breaks rules of his cultural system of the day in following God, uh, one God, instead of following many gods. And even though Paul does, even though Abraham, excuse me, does get circumcised as part of the story, and the theory here is that's probably why this community that's been in uh, arguments with the Galatian community is bringing Abraham up to say, look, this hero, he got circumcised, right? So that's why we all need to get circumcised. Uh, so he does that. But Abraham's life is still full of tons of mistakes, tons of law-breaking, uh, an entire account that deviates from the law that's actually a conditional law. So how do we make sense of this? Where the law has to call Abraham an outlaw, a rule-breaker, someone who's outside of a system. The promise from God, and this promise is that God will bless all people through Abraham, that promise of God actually stays with Abraham. That promise actually calls Abraham a friend. That promise is faithful, even when Abram and Abraham is faithless. And Abraham actually receives that promise as a gift. He receives it as something good in his life, as something that he can cherish. And given Abraham's behavior, that's, that's a really good thing that he does that. He's actually able in the midst of his mess to open up his hands and to say, I receive this gift that you're giving me. Even if I don't know where this place I'm going is, even if I don't know how I'm going to have kids, I receive this story as a gift. I receive this promise as a gift. And I just say, I trust you. That's the kind of faith that Abraham demonstrates, even as he breaks real rules with real consequences. How do we do at receiving from God? Not working, not acting, not accomplishing, but how do we just do at receiving something from God? Do we find ourselves in that posture often of receiving a promise, a blessing through the gift of faith? Whether we're just kind of checking out Jesus and wondering, hey, do I, do I just work at this? Do I learn more? Or is there something I actually kind of can just receive, I can feel, something that happens to me? Whether we've been following Jesus for a long time and we might think maybe it could be about our activity, what we do. Or do we wait? Do we get quiet sometimes? And do we receive from God? And do we think what we receive is actually something good, something that's a gift? I think in that way we'd be tied in, right, to the story of Abraham. We would be kind of this ancient, distant relative to Abraham, this person of blessing. Not earning our standing through our own work, but actually being tied into a story where the work has already been done. Is that what we're doing, what we're learning here? Or do we adhere to some kind of law? whether it be religious, whether it be cultural, whether it be civil, as a way of earning what we see as kind of an equivalent promise, the desire to be morally good in some area, to be an amazing friend to someone, to make it, truly make it in our careers, or to not rock the boat by not breaking any of the rules of society. What path do we think actually saves us? Is it faith or is it rules? Is it faith or is it the law? And regardless of what we think the answer to that question is, because uh, some of us might be like, oh, I think I know what the right one is. Regardless of what we think the right answer is, which path do we kind of feel more familiar with? Is it the one of control? Um, is it the one that feels a little scary? And just where do we resonate in our hearts, whether or not we know kind of what the right answer might be? And if you're like me, you might find yourself drawn to the story of faith. It seems beautiful, it seems amazing, right? 
but you're stuck with the familiarity of the rules and the law. And I, I think we need to realize something here that Paul's been getting at, and I think it's an important place in this journey of Galatians. Following the path of faith and not the path of the law requires a complete reimagining of the world. To follow the path of faith and not the path of law actually requires us to reimagine what the world truly is. I think it's that big, and we'll see that even more next week, but I think it's actually that big. Just think about, just for instance, kind of a case study here, think about Abraham's journey and Paul's journey. Just two people living life, and then all of a sudden a living and active God intervened in their lives, like spoke to them, like encountered them, in the midst of their own rules of their society, the rules of their culture, God became real to them in a fundamentally new way. And I think both people would say, oh, I have this kind of belief in a higher power. You know, Paul for sure, but even Abraham, I think you'd think there was something else out there. But then God intervened specifically to them in their stories. That's a way that I think the world got completely reimagined. You see how God gives them a, a way to trust but it's dependent on God being alive and at work in the world. And I think another way, and this might challenge us, that we need to reimagine the world is somehow to accept the smallness of our journey with the vastness of this promise. Can we expect how small we might think our next step in this journey of faith is, even though the promise is vast and big and grand? What do we mean by that? Well, Abraham and Paul are given calls of being blessed and eventually blessing all people. It's an enormous process, but what kind of steps do they take at first? They actually take small steps. They don't game out an entire system, and if they do, in the case of both of them, they kind of get corrected for it. But they just have a next step to take. By trusting God for today and for their next step, they ready themselves for a lifetime of faithfulness. Not a game plan, right, that they create it from day one. That's not what they're faithful to. They're faithful to the person. They're faithful to the voice. They're faithful to the promise coming to pass in their lives. And what's the real good news here? I think that that's true, but also, like, Abraham messed up a lot, and the promise was still his. It didn't get revoked. If we're here kind of wondering, but does that mean I need to be perfect? Does that mean I need to fall? It doesn't. Right? There's a way that we too can mess up, but the promise still stands. The promise isn't conditional. The promise is a gift. It's a gift for us. So that day-to-day -day kind of life, that day-to-day -day kind of faithfulness, uh, there's a question of, are we too beneath that? Is it too small for us? Does the simplicity of that actually offend us somehow? Does it just kind of rub us the wrong way? And I think here we need to remember that accepting simplicity is actually not abandoning the greatness of God that can be in our lives and our community. Simplicity and God's greatness aren't opposed to one another. In fact, I think it dares us to trust that God's good work can come not from a master plan, but simply from day-to-day -day obedience, from day-to-day -day faithfulness. That God's greatness, his good plan for your life, his good plan for our community can come through faithful living, not just plans that we make up. And this trust, I think, has to lead us to reimagine a world as a place where God can intervene, as a place that has many possibilities, a place where faithfulness can actually change what Paul calls this present evil age, this place that we're in. And this reimagining of the world is not something that we do, but it's something that we become aware of, something we almost like let wash over our vision so we can see it as the new reality. Paul gives this work and the person that accomplishes this to Jesus. He says that that's really who it is. And he says that uh, this is how the curse story, how it finishes. This is how that example ends, the story of the curse. Here's what happens to it. Um, it's Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the law has this curse on it. And how is that curse taken away? It's taken away by Jesus, by Jesus' sacrificial act of dying at the hands of the law for the false charges of blasphemy and insurrection. Somehow those false charges that Jesus took on remove a curse that the law brings. Uh, through this, actually, Jesus literally buys us. He redeems us back out of the curse with his life. 
um, freeing us from our otherwise doomed path of depending on the inheritance. If you just go to the middle one that we see um, in uh, this. And this just says, for the inheritance comes from the law, it no longer comes from the promise, but God granted it to Abraham through the promise. This was a way that Paul's really invested in the inheritance not coming from the law, but coming from Jesus, coming from faith, coming from trust. Our inheritance now comes through him by faith, a blessing that Abraham was somehow given, this kind of ancient figure, somehow comes all the way down to us through trust, through relationship, through this simple call to say yes to go that I don't think Abraham could have ever believed in um, or hoped if he was explained the whole thing. And so while I hope this moves us to awe, to celebration, to deepen love, I think we have a pretty important question of what does this actually look like practically in our lives? Uh, we can say yes to go or kind of know that that's what we're supposed to say, but I think if we just were thinking that way, that probably wouldn't help us, like just creating, creating a new rule. But I think we have to actually identify the places that we're vulnerable to trusting another rule, to trusting another law, to trusting another system that's not according to the promise, a place that there's something conditional in our lives as opposed to this good news, the free gift that we can receive. I think in those vulnerable places, we can really see the damage, the work that a law can do to us. How it gives us kind of false inheritance, something that's not really ours, but something that sometimes we're too eager to accept. Sometimes it can look like overconfidence, independence, isolation. That can be what the path turns into. Other times it can look like comparison or jealousy, anger or sadness. This is a, a place that these false inheritances can take us. And they can look different for each of us. And wherever that false inheritance drives you, uh, the law I think you followed betrays you at that time. And its systems have enslaved you to itself. This is why Paul's so invested in freeing us and freeing us from this present evil age. I think we need to be able to see and identify these false inheritances in our lives and yearn for another way, yearn for a path of freedom. And when we've identified these places, we need to be bold enough to, to press this promise, this promise of God's goodness in our lives to those specific areas. And this is where the path can involve waiting and trusting. It can involve waiting and growing uncomfortable with new patterns that God's introducing in your life. It can involve waiting and struggling with hope and God's plan to bless you and to bless others. It can involve waiting and just being surprised that God's doing something, that he's showing up. I think one of the things that involves mainly, you probably get it by now, it's waiting. It's waiting to actually receive what God is doing next. And sometimes this is our main posture when we live lives of trust, is simply to be able to wait and to wait well to see what God is doing and not replace God with any other system, with any other rule, with any other law, but to say, I'm going to wait on the real God, on who he really is. I think sometimes this is actually freedom. This is a mature freedom. And it takes work, which often we don't associate with freedom. We're not used to that. But it takes work to realize that we have to sometimes receive and fight for the freedom that God is giving to us, that he's bringing to us in our lives. And this often happens as we see other things happen in our life around us. Other ways that things are going well, other people that are doing different things, even other structures that are saying, this is what you need to do. Uh, at a critical time in my life, my senior year, I was watching my peers, and even though they majored in different things, they all seemed to be applying for law school and medical school. I'm like, wait, you did like art, and now you're doing medical? I, I was really confused. Like, everyone was just applying for like those two things. And then of course, some prestigious fellowships. So it's like, you had like three paths. So I'm like, I'm not on any of these paths. This feels really confusing. Like, I don't know why all my friends are doing this. Um, but somehow they all were. At least that's what it felt like. And so at, at the end of the four years, I had these strange desires, um, strange kind of uh, ways I thought my life was going to work. Uh, they were three. Um, they were few. And I'd call them kind of like these burning, scattered passions. I'm not embarrassed about them, so I'll share them with you now, boldly, with confidence. My first one was to pursue a woman I was not yet dating named Tina. Um, that was one of my kind of like deep things I was feeling in, that, in my life at that time. I won't, I won't go into more of that. Um, second one was to love a city called New Haven that I barely explored during my college years and specifically to get to know uh, low-income areas in the neighborhood that I hadn't really explored and also people who lived outside who I'd seen but not really, not really gotten to know. Another thing I hoped would happen. And then the last was to continue, the, to continue this odd um, but exciting path that I was discovering in my life of pastoral ministry. 
in a dynamic church that somehow engaged with Jesus more than anything else, a church I had not yet found at that time. This might surprise you, but there was no major that prepared me for any of that, especially the, the Tina part. There wasn't <laughs> Tina studies. In fact, almost everything formal at the school prepared me for the opposite of this. Um, don't get involved in a serious relationship, especially when you can't match your seven-year plan with their seven-year plan. Um, if it's not guaranteed to work out perfectly, just kind of cut that. You don't, you don't need that in your life. Um, don't walk too far outside the college bubble. Um, just don't do it. And if you, could, if you spend one more day than you have to, I, I wouldn't do that either. Just, just uh, kind of avoid that for New Haven. Ministry? Question mark? That, those words just didn't even compute. Uh, the other ones had like sentences, but ministry was just kind of a question mark. Um, my passions that I felt actually were calls in my life were not really respected by the Yale establishment, or at least my part of Yale. Um, but still, I felt a go from God. I felt like I was actually being asked to, to lean out on him and to follow the wisdom of that voice. Suddenly, my plan, yes, I have to, I did have a plan to go to law school. I was like, well, maybe, maybe I should do it. If everyone else is doing it, maybe I should. Um, my, my plan to do that faded away. And my uh, new plan to stay in New Haven um, kind of won out. And I did it under the auspices of going to Divinity School. Somebody I didn't even know existed my freshman year of college. I was like, wait, what's that? I didn't know there was something. Oh, okay, a Divinity School. Um, but it, actually, I kind of felt like Divinity School was my cover for doing these other things I felt uh, really called to do, uh, to continue to pursue this woman that now is my wife, um, to give more time to see if I could actually develop any real relationships in the city, um, in real places of the city, not just kind of like a block from Yale, but actually in the neighborhoods uh, that the city has, the neighborhoods that we're now currently exploring through our neighborhood challenge. Um, and to actually find a church that focused on Jesus um, and his mission. And to be honest, that didn't feel like a heroic thing. That didn't feel radical to me. Um, it just felt like right. It, was, it made a weird kind of sense, as if that was my story, as if that was the thing I was saying yes to, and that was uh, a place that had God's momentum behind it. Um, I knew the inheritance that my degree offered and the past that my peers were taking, they did feel mandated to me in a certain way. It felt like I was supposed to do that. Um, but it also kind of felt like, wait, if I just have to do this, then isn't that kind of like enslavement in a way to this kind of privilege that somehow I'm supposed to just keep attaining and earning and earning and earning, and then when does that end? And I didn't know the answer to that. And I felt like there was a different way to shape my path, um, and I wanted to do that. That felt beautiful to me. I think God gave me a desire for that. Uh, the promise of God blessing us and blessing all of his people I think that seemed to fit well with the story. I didn't really even connect that, but I just, it just seemed right to me. Um, so I tried to receive the promise. I tried to receive the gospel. And I tried to see it as personalized to me and to my story, um, as if God was actually providing for me, as if, she, as if he was actually giving me my next step. And as I waited, I saw God draw near to me and what he did in my life. Um, I found this church in the summer after I graduated. Actually, the first Sunday after I graduated, I came here to ECV. I asked Tina out, and she said yes in that same summer that I found ECV. Uh, the next summer, I found a partnership in a community called Agape Church for the Homeless. I saw how these kind of, uh, this call to go and saying yes yielded some connections, uh, some very important connections. Um, and all of these paths have really had incredible rocky moments since I've said yes to the call of go. And it didn't end with something where it's like, oh, you're done. You're done kind of trusting. You're done with faith. I've had to continue that, actually, a lot. Um, but I learned to trust God in a different kind of way, um, that this kind of promise of the Spirit, of receiving the promise of the Spirit through faith, um, actually could come true. God could meet me there. But just God, like the real God, in that story, in my story, um, God was responsive to me. Not always in words, not always with like kind of this like, um, really known presence, but I just felt like I think God's behind me. I think he's with me in all of this. And that gave me a fighting shot at re resting and receiving the goodness of God. I think this is the unconditional promise that we all have, a promise for God to be with us, to actually bless us and to bless others, a promise that he's made that he can free us, rescue us from sin, and also from the present evil age, the systems of this world that are being undone through God's presence here and now. It's our job to trust in that promise, to shed the ways that we rely on the law, the conditional law, and to give in to a good thing that's just a gift. Paul Reese Paul states this, this next part, I 
think I have. Yeah. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus might be given to those who believe. Is law by itself bad? Of course not. Is law next to a human bad? Yes. <laughs> Paul was kind of really cheery here, but he's basically saying law by itself isn't opposed to anything. But law as we make it, law with us, does get messy. It becomes conditional. We stop receiving things as a gift and working at things as if they're conditional efforts. That's a losing battle for us. What's not a losing battle is surrendering our control, our ability to force ourselves right with the world, and even forcing ourselves right with God, and simply receiving what God has for us. Receiving a kind of freedom to not be the mistakes that we've made, receiving a kind of freedom uh, not to just be tied into structures and systems, but to receive a freedom that actually is a gift and a relationship that we can have with God. And this path of trust of receiving the Spirit through faith does involve God's work, and it is mysterious. But I think actually that mystery is really important because it gives God space to be God, um, to be with us and to be for us. And it gives us space, I think, much needed space to rest and receive and actually have God care for us. I think we have an invitation here today to have God care for us, to meet us, to minister to us, to receive a posture of rest, to receive a posture of trusting God. And I want um, our worship team to come up because I feel like worship is gonna be a part of that. Communion will be a part of that. Prayer will be a part of that. As I come up, I want uh, to pass uh, something out. I don't think we've done this at ECV definitely in a while, maybe ever. Um, but it's just a verse from our time today, from our scripture. Just print it on a piece of paper. And Sprouts downstairs, they call it a memory verse. And they call it that because it's a verse that you commit to memory. A verse that can actually give life, can be important to us. And the verse today, um, you should find it familiar from what we've been saying, is Galatians 3.11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the one who is righteous will live by faith. And as we think about that and reflect on that and dare I say even memorize that, I think we can use that as an encouragement to us <coughs> that we can't find our right standing with the law. Um, but righteousness, which we often use to say, well, that's another good moral quality, but actually I think it's just receiving this trust, this gift from God that that actually is what can help us live with trust. When God says go, I just ask that we would have the courage to say yes. And in communion, we celebrate Jesus' moment of doing that, of God giving a plan, of saying a plan for, for Jesus' life, and Jesus saying yes and being faithful to that. That was a plan for him to give his life away uh, for our sake, uh, a plan for us to receive from his sacrifice a plan that involved uh, the breaking of his body, uh, which in our celebration actually is remembered by bread, and the blood that he shed is remembered by drink. It's in this act that we can see again, once again, that we can actually trust God, and we can receive the gifts that he's given us through communion. And so if you're at a place where you need to trust God more, whether you follow Jesus, whether you want to commit to trusting God for the first time, I encourage you to take a piece of the bread, to dip it into the cup, and to remember that we have someone who's already sacrificed for us, uh, to woo us with his love, uh, to show us that he's trustworthy. We have a, a way, a chance to respond in faithfulness and trust, to say, thank you, God, for what you've done. Help me continue to trust you, or to trust you even for the first time. I pray that in the rest of our time together, we'll be able to really receive, whether it's through music, sitting down, standing up, um, engaging with God in this time because God does have good things for us he has a gift, he has a promise he wants to give us it can't come through our work, it can't th come through conditions, but it can come through us receiving it as a gift